Hey everyone, how's it going? This is MLS Weech and welcome to another weekly episode where we look at some book covers, talk about what makes them work, offer a little bit of uh, uh, a few ideas on what we think we could do to make them a little better. And then we let you vote on your favorite in the links down below. Speaking of down below, would you do me a favor and please click the like and subscribe buttons. It is a very kind way to show support for the idea. And after all we're trying to do is uh, get some notoriety out there for some authors and more, more specifically for, for good book covers. Um, I am your host, MLS Weech. I'm a self-published author. And another way you can support me personally is to go down into my Amazon link in the description down below. There's a lot going on down there. Um, but you can go on down there and uh, look at my books and see if any of them interest you. And that would be very kind. So we are starting week four in the September book cover of the month. And we always start by naming the winner for last week. So let's do that. The week three winner for uh, September is The Maleficent Seven by Cameron Johnson. Uh, you know, this cover is just really awesome. I love the way they created this flaming sunrise, you know, fisheye lens looking background and all the dynamic little silhouettes around it. I just think the cover sings. I just think it looks really epic. It looks like a fantasy version of the Wild Wild West, which I'm pretty sure is exactly what the author and designer were going for. And they knocked it out of the park. So big congratulations to them. They're going to be in the September overall book cover of the month poll, which will start next week when we also get into October. For now, though, we got to talk about the book covers for week four so that you know which ones to choose from. Uh, so I got to be honest, this week, uh, first off, obviously this is airing late. Usually uh, these videos post at midnight on Saturdays, uh, you know, 12 a.m. Saturdays. Uh, and this video, obviously, it's somewhere around four or five o'clock, depending on where you are. And that's one because my middle son is in the marching band. So I'm going to be spending Fridays watching him and cheering for him. Uh, so we're still going to post these videos on Saturdays, uh, but they may drop late on occasion whenever they have a home game. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that uh, this was not the strongest week for book covers. I made it through like 30 pages uh, and it was just really, really hard. So I actually went over to the thriller and suspense side of things uh, uh, just to find uh a seventh cover uh so it it, it it was pretty slim pickings for book covers uh hopefully hopefully you'll like at least one of them uh and all the ones we're going to talk about today accomplish good things but it took a long time just to find these seven and that's why this first cover we're going to talk about doesn't look anything like science fiction or fantasy that's because it's not falling by tj newman is a, a, a suspense thriller. T.J. Newman is a best-selling author. Uh, I love the use of text in this cover. Um, I love how they use the uh, the color palette to go from the cool uh, aqua cool colors all the way to that uh, 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 light red, uh, creating a sense of falling in the fire. Um, I also like that uh, the the text breaks up the plane in some places. But that said, it really bugs me that there's this one segment of plane that is visible. And it's the only, no, it's not. There's two of them, this one and this one. But it's, it's not consistent. Now, maybe the designer did that on purpose. Uh, uh, it just drives me a little nuts that like, you know, the, the black is where there's a, a, a a clipping of the aircraft and we call this a clean select uh, uh where i teach but but the it, it, it's here is visible when it, it doesn't feel like it should be and it's here and it's visible when i don't think it should be does that really impact and right here as well does that really impact the quality of the cover no it's still really awesome um but but it, it's really noticeable uh that said um there's a lot of coincidence in this um, uh, I do think this is a nice cover. I do think it's interesting, but uh, I haven't forgotten that this is September 11th. 
Um, and so this provides me an opportunity to say that uh, um, there are a lot of people who have moved forward. Uh, again, when I teach, it's weird because I have students who weren't alive uh, in 9-11. Uh, and that's 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 kind of that's kind of weird. Uh, uh, you know, people I work with, they were in kindergarten, third grade. Um, and, you know, for me, I had to be in my mid 20s uh, or early 20s. And it seems it seems strange. And what I realized is that um, there are people who aren't moving on because 9-11 wasn't at an event in their life. But there are people who are still struggling to move on because 9-11 meant that for about 3,000 people, uh, uh, their lives changed forever because loved ones passed away. And I just want to say to, to the families of those 3,000 people, uh, we haven't forgotten what had happened to them. We haven't forgotten you. Um, I think that as a nation, we should always strive to not let villainy rule over us. Um, but on the same side, we want to make sure that we never, we never fall away from offering our love and support for people. And 20 years is a long time, but you know, I'm going to remember the death of my mother for as long as I live. Uh, she was not involved in 9-11. She died about three years ago uh, because of cancer. My point that I'm trying to make in this is that when you lose someone you love, you know, three years, four years, 20 years, that, that, that loss isn't something that someone just, you know, gets over. I do hope that for those involved, they found some sort of comfort in their lives. I do hope that um, there comes a time when this day isn't so hard in their hearts. Um, and so I just kind of want to offer support to them. And then I wanted to offer my support. Obviously I teach in a military school. I love our veterans. I love our service members. Uh, those men and women who are out there defending freedom and, and, and working to keep our country safe and working to obey our president, whoever that may be and serve our country, whoever may be running it. Uh, you have to be a different sort of human being to do that. And um, I want to offer my support. I want to say that, that what you are doing is amazing. You're doing things so that my sons can, can go to school and feel safe. Uh, uh, we can go to parks and events uh, because you're out there making sure that people aren't trying to do these kinds of things again. So thank you. I appreciate you. I know this is a huge tangent from what we normally do, but I, I just felt that since this post is going to air on 9-11, I had to at least say something. Uh, hopefully we can move forward without uh, much more. Again, this the cover that we were just looking at, it wasn't something that I consciously said, hey, let's look for a cover that will let me lead into this. Uh, maybe some people out there kind of do those things and, and I, I wouldn't begrudge anyone doing it. It just seemed, you know, coincidental to me. And it was a nice opportunity. So the rest of the covers do uh, stem from the science fiction and fantasy world. And the next one we're going to talk about is The High Mountain Court by A.K. Mulford. Uh, so this is interesting use of line art. Uh, sometimes I use the word interesting and it, and it kind of has a connotation that I don't necessarily want to say is false but it doesn't necessarily mean bad. Um, it's an interesting use of line art because it's one line, really. This is all this is. It's just one continuous arching line, maybe a few little paths here, that create the sense of a mountain range or a mountain peak. And that's really all it is. Uh, um, I don't know that I call it figure ground because figure ground relies on the absence of space creating a shape. Uh, and that's not really what's going on here, um, uh, not, not from my point of view. The broken frame seems interesting to me, but it also creates uh, an odd sense of depth. 
Uh, if they're going to do this technique where the frame kind of disappears in one part, I would have I would have had the whole lower frame missing and only the part um, because it can't be layering because if the mountain was in front of the frame, then how can I see the bottom of the frame? I do think that this font is well chosen. It's very hard to find a legible font that's also artistic. Um, I usually play it safe. But for the designers who are out there really looking for unique fonts that aren't distracting, overly quirky, or just flat out hard to read, they deserve a lot of credit when they do that. So those are some of the good aspects in, in this particular cover. The next cover we're going to talk about is Dwarf and Dunn by Martha Carr and obviously uh, uh, Michael Anderley. So if you watch this channel, uh, you might argue I see Michael Anderley every week, and that is true. Maybe. I don't know. I've never, I haven't gone back and looked at whether or not Michael Anderley is in every week. I've never read any of his books. I think his book covers or book covers with his name on it are amazing. Uh, the only thing I know about Michael Anderley is that person is prolific. Every week he has some sort of new title out there, and that's why you're seeing it this way. Uh, I would imagine he has to be incredibly successful just, just in the sheer volume of products that he puts out. I mean, if I were releasing a title a week or, or I had my name on something that, that appeared every week, um, I, would, I would have to think that that individual is really performing, uh, really receiving a lot of, of, of work for his effort. But it's not a bias thing. It's just a volume thing. Uh, I love this portrait of this, you know, big modern day looking dwarf with this giant fire axe. Uh, the black of the heft of the handle, the end of the handle, it's a little hard to see over a black background. Um, I might have considered like a muted gray or a stone gray, but then his shirt would be lost. Uh, I would have looked for a background color that helped to stand out, or I would have looked to just bring the handle and make it more gray. Um, uh, just because it gets lost a little bit there, it's still easy enough to see. Uh, and for people who don't have color issues the way my eyes do, maybe you look at it and it's not so hard to make out. Um, I like the I like the font choice. Um, I think it's kind of cool that there's a Dwarf Bounty Hunter series out there. If I were in the days when when I could just read leisurely whenever I wished, I'd pick at least one of these up because, you know, a Dwarf Bounty Hunter? I mean, that's got to be awesome, right? Um, I'm not really sure what's going on with the this stuff in the background. I don't know if it's a shape or forest or uh, a skeletal frame. It's, it's really hard to see. <clears throat> and I don't know that I need it because I can't make it out. So what is the... Uh, you know, when you're doing design, you want your background elements to, to at least be identifiable. Uh, and if any of you, again, if you know what that is going on in the background, if you let us know uh, in the comments down below, I'd appreciate it. But if you can't make it out, then don't put it in. Let, let it be a, a pure black background um, or pure, you know, a pure off-color background that allows this beautifully rendered uh, portrait to stand out. The next cover we're going to look at is called The Great Council by Pedro Urvi. Uh, the Great Council, uh, I, I think I like the way uh, in photography, you'd have to use a technique called fill flash. So you have these sparklers in the background, and that's going to silhouette a figure. And the only way to have these sparklers in the background and be able to see the figure in front of the background is to flood that figure with light or fill him in with light. That might be a her, I don't know these days. But the, um, the, the way this figure stands is only possible to see if you use another light source to fill in the shadows. Um, I like the detail in the rendering. The, the font choice is legible if not unique. Uh, so if, if, you, if you, you can't be unique and give up legibility, you can't be unique and give up visibility. So if you can't be unique and still be visible and legible, just go with easy to read and you're probably making the right decision. Uh, so interesting use of techniques. Uh, I'm not, you know, I don't know why anyone holds weapons that way. Uh, that's not the most, uh, uh, that's not the best fighting stance. Um, it, it seems a little strange in that. Plus, he's got arrows in his, in his quiver, and I, I, I don't see a bow on him anywhere. 
I mean, he's got an axe, a knife, a bunch of arrows, and no bow. Uh, so those are a few things that I might have mentioned in, in the design. You could have him with a bow. You can have the bow looped around him, and he's in a fighting stance. It just seems a little weird that this guy's, you know, uh, uh, standing in that awkward posture with those weapons, and there's no evidence of the bow that he would need to use the arrows on his back. Uh, but all in all, I still like nice detail. That's good use of color. It's a good use of fill flash. So it still deserves a little bit of credit. Next cover we're going to look at is called A Broken Alliance by, uh, um, let me see, I have to see the names. Uh, the author names are only last names in the on the actual cover, which I actually am frustrated by. Uh, this is by J.N. Cheney and uh, Jonathan P. Berets. And uh, this is a uh, looks kind of like Halo. Uh, it's a military uh, image. I'm bringing it up for you now. I just had to look up those names. Uh, I like the dynamics of it. I like that it looks like a, a moment caught in combat. There's a lot of chaos going on. Um, one thing I actually thought was cool was you see all these all this flame and all these laser bolts flying around and this guy in the background. Uh, a lot of elements are leading you back to this main figure in the foreground. And that's wise designing. That's uh, good composition in a scene that would be very difficult to compose as a photographer. Uh, you'd have to move around. Uh, um, generally, you don't want things going through people's heads. That's not, that's not typically a thing you'd want to do. But if they're going to be very, very small and those elements work together to kind of keep drawing your eye to that figure, you're breaking a traditional rule of composition to accomplish the general goal of composition. The idea of composition is all the elements lead the eye to where they're supposed to go. And when you have a, a, a center of focus um, or a main part of the image you want people to look at, then you want all the other parts to to put the eye, to bring the eye back to that figure. And that's what these elements do. It's a good example of doing things that shouldn't, that are not typically wise to meet the goal that is more important than the rules that exist for the sake of the goal. I hope that makes sense. The next cover we're gonna look at is The Holy Grail War by Armanus A.R. Finial. I hope I pronounced that right. So this is a more simplistic cover. You have this little splash of light. You have the uh, these weird symbols. Uh, I, I imagine there's some sort of prophecy lore in here, or there's some sort of symbology involved there. Um, so on one hand, if you're watching this, you'd be like, well, three book covers ago, you said, if you can't make it out, you shouldn't put it in there. In this case, it's not, it's not as important and the distinction between the two is I can tell that this is some sort of line art design. This is a part of a symbol. And because the eye recognizes that it's a part of a symbol, it's way more successful than, is that a creature? Is that bones? Is that, you know, is that a part of a symbol? What's going on back there? If you can recognize it, you don't have to see all of it. The problem isn't complete visibility. It's giving enough detail to allow the eye to understand what it is so it can move on throughout the rest of the design. And then you have this smoke figure going, uh, uh, moving around, it weaves us through the text. Um, I like that they're at least thinking about how to arrange their, their, their lettering and their words um, to group together into a more pleasing uh, uh, distinction. Uh, I like the silhouette, but I like silhouettes as a whole. So even though this cover is really, really simplistic, it's, it's super effective in that it, it's readable. I can look at it and see what's going on. I have a general sense for the, what this book might offer. And that's all anyone can ask out of a book cover. The last book cover we're gonna go over, um, it, it feels, it, yeah, it feels a little weird, but it doesn't take away from the overall aesthetic appeal. Uh, the name of the book is called The Goblin and the Dancer by Alison Tebow. And uh, if I bring this image up and you go, that's Elsa in a pink dress. I, I can't argue with you. It's Elsa in a pink dress. And maybe the author went up and said, hey, I need Elsa in a pink dress. Um, you know, um, but if this is for younger readers, 
uh, and they look at it and they they mentally correlate this figure as Elsa in a pink dress, you're probably going to draw the kind of attention you want. Uh, now, if you're not trying to draw that, then then I don't know what to do. But there's there's a lot of this book cover that kind of screams, uh, what is it, Frozen? Um, there are some parts that are unique. And uh, maybe because I'm actually a fan of the show, maybe I'm a little biased. Uh, I don't know. Again, let me know in the comments down below. If, if you think this is Elsa in a pink dress, I... I I'd appreciate the validation at the very least. If I'm just a crazy person, well, then you can let me know that too. You can really say whatever you want down there. Um, the lighting is very, very well done. The detail in the dress is very, very well done. It's actually very, very hard to do hands in art, any kind of art. Doing hands is very, very challenging. And then musculature, things like that. That's why you, know, you go to art school and you have the, the people sitting on a chair and they're doing all the shapes because drawing muscles and drawing shapes is actually a skill set that requires a lot of practice. And this figure is very, very well rendered, regardless of what prominent figure it may appear to be similar to. Um, the little sprinkles of, of light around the figure don't do, don't, don't do anything to diminish those comparisons. If the author and the designer want those comparisons, they're doing the right thing. But if this isn't a very frozen tone kind of story, uh, then I, I worry that people who buy this book because they think, oh, this looks like Frozen. I want a story that reminds me of Frozen. And it's not, it's not similar to that story in some way, then, then readers might be a little bit upset. So I hope that's what they were going for. Those are all the book covers uh, uh, we have for you this week. Please go down to the link below and vote on your favorite. It takes like eight seconds. Uh, uh, you just kind of glance at them and say, yeah, I think that was the best. Um, and, you know, share it with your friends. Uh, I want to thank you for being with me. I want to thank you for hanging out. We will see you next week when we start the September book of the month, the, the, the final poll for the entire month of September and get into October. I want to wish you all a wonderful week. I want to wish you all... Um, I don't want to say happy because that's certainly not the tone. Um, I hope that this day of remembrance is one in which you find comfort and encouragement. And as always, I wish that God be with you. Have a great week. Bye.